<clears throat> this is a very difficult thing for me to talk about. Um, it's uh, a very old piece of work and when I started trying to unscramble my head a bit last night I realized how unfamiliar I am with it at one level. Um, but I hope I'm familiar enough to make some sense. It is a very very abstract piece of work. It makes no attempt to connect to anything real or experiential at all. And people find it uh, very difficult, I think, for that, for that reason. Um, uh, <coughs> what I'm going, what I, what I decided to do was to start um, with a little bit of background on this and then to try to create um, the beginnings of this thing that I call the theory of objects which was um, what my PhD became. My PhD was supposed to be about the use of electronics um, to create a more interactive responsive environment, physical environment, architectural environment um, so it was, a, you know, a, you're talking analog circuitry, this sort of thing, like the electronic music I made was uh, tape and splice and so on. So it's really a technology that almost no one in this room would have played with. <laughs> um, and uh, it drifted from that, and it drifted because the time I was studying was the time second order cybernetics was being invented. <coughs> so it has to do with that. But I, I'll start a little bit earlier. I went to a, f a real verbal kindergarten. So we use the word kindergarten, um, which is a word that Friedrich Froebel invented. Uh, we use it sort of in a generic way. Um, but Froebel had very clear and strong views on education. He was extraordinary um, and at the center of his view is the idea that um, the child knows his own way and that the teacher's job is to stand behind the child and to support the child as the child moves and that if we impose on children we create um, psychological and social problems that the imposition of education and enforced learning, curricula and so on, on people uh, is deeply damaging to people and to society. Uh, Froebel was saying this in about 1820, and it's interesting that, I mean, Maria Montessori, who's much better known than Froebel, um, took the ideas but didn't understand the bit about you don't force it, and so turned it into a curriculum and a process. For Froebel, this is something which is individual and the, the teachers get taught in a very particular way to, to pick up a, a, a sense and signs of, of the child trying to move in particular ways. And I remember one thing from my nursery schooling, which was one day my mother came to collect me I think I was about three and a half, four, and no, I must have been a bit older. Anyway, I tripped running down the path to her, and I grazed my knee, and I got up and I said, "Tomorrow I'm going to be good at mathematics," and I was. And before that, I'd been terrible at it. Um, Froebel was very concerned with this notion of the individual and freedom. That the child will find his own way and will make his her uh, own path and their own meanings and sense of the world. And I was deeply touched by that. And a lot of what I have tried to do is about that. So, um, when I was writing a lot of music, at least half of it was music to allow other people to make their own music. 
So at the time in the 1960s, there was sort of a lot of do-it-yourself music. That people sort of thought of John Cage, but Cage really wasn't. Well, Cage was part of that, but much more, I think, was the the people who the English thought were English Cajuns, but actually they weren't. People like Cornelius Cardew, who came out of folk music. And although I have no appreciative ear for almost all folk music, <laughs> I think it's odious. <coughs> and that snarly voice that people put on to sing it and so on. Um, there, there was this, and I was, I was a part of two avant-gardes at once. I was part of the English um, post-serialist, really hard-edge composition. I was making electronic music, and I was really one of the very first people in this country to do it. And I was doing it in the kitchen, you know, kitchen sink stuff, no equipment. It was, so I had one sine wave generator. Imagine building things from that. Um, and the other bit was this sort of participatory stuff. So I think that that has always been very important to me. The reason, one reason I'm interested in a conference like this is that it makes room for people to participate. It makes more room than most conferences and it, it recognizes that we think differently and it, I, I hope it sort of respects that. So that's sort of a bit of a beginning, and it's absolutely salient to this. I, I, one thing I should add is that, um, of course, when you make these systems, when you make when you make systems of support or whatever you want to call them, um, you they're not just support for other people; they're also support for you. So you are one of the people who is supposed to gain the freedom. I am one of the people who is supposed to gain the freedom. Um, when I began studying cybernetics, um, properly it was 1971, I think, it was an accident. I knew Gordon Pask because I designed internet shopping as a, an architecture project in 1967. Um, and my final projects were things like what we would now call a smartphone, and these sorts of things. Uh, and Gordon Pass was uh, associated with the architecture school I was at, and he um, was on the final examination panel. In fact, I passed my examination. I only started working on drawing the stuff up the night before the final exam and everyone else spent three months. Um, but I scared everyone out of the room with the most appalling signs. I mean, truly dreadful signs. It was very loud. The only person left sitting was Gordon. Um, so they couldn't fail me because they hadn't actually examined me, but I was there for the exam. It was the examiners who hadn't turned up. So um, they couldn't fail me, but they did exclude me, the only person ever excluded from the end of the year exhibition. Um, but uh, all right, <laughs> not a bit of paranoia, it's a sort of amusement. Um, and Gordon said afterwards, he said, ah, I've got you a scholarship. You're going to do a PhD with me. And I didn't know anyone had a PhD. I was at, at the artiest of all architecture schools. Uh, it was unimaginable. Um, <clears throat> uh, so anyway, off I went with this further stuff with electronic. But it was just this time that second order cybernetics was beginning to get shaped. And Gordon talked about, he talked about Lars Lofgren. He talked about uh, Lofgren's paper on self-reproduction. Um, and he talked about Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And he talked, um, and, and Frank George, who was the other professor, talked about these things a lot because for Frank was really a logician who was interested in gambling um, and he was he designed systems to guarantee that you won gambling he sold these you know, so, um, and uh, of course the question of whether you can completely describe a formal system uh, was a very important question and it was a, a wonderful mind teaser and Gordon talked about this man Lofgren um, uh, a key figure 
but one who remains shrouded in mystery because he really does not he only wants to talk his own work so when he goes to a conference he presents his paper and then wants to talk about it and then vanishes um, and he uh, is very reluctant I wanted to do a festschrift for him and he just wouldn't have it wouldn't have it wouldn't have it so at the end I got lazy um, <coughs> but, but he produced this paper which talked about um, <sighs> the way that Gordon described it was that uh, you can imagine some system and you make a model of it and the model is not perfect, that is, it is not complete and consistent, that's the GERD and the criteria. And he talked about how you could then make a model of that which would reduce the difference so that you could improve the relationship of the model to the original. And he then said, well, but what is the model of the model? Not when I have the constructed meta-model to correct them. And he said, well, in a sense, the model of the model is the object that's being modeled. And so he started producing this thing where these two were converging. And where the object was a model of the model as much as the model was a model of the object. And in this sense, it became circular and it became self-referential. And if you allowed that time element in, you could imagine that you could produce a model which was complete and consistent. So it was a way of avoiding this metamathematical question to Gödel, um, squashed Hilbert's question about maths. <clears throat> and I just remember being dumbstruck by this. Uh, I mean, I, I was the artiest of architecture students. In, in my five years of architecture school, I'd never done any architecture. I left architecture school with no idea of what architecture was, was asked back to teach it, and so I've been a first year student ever since. Yeah. Um, learning what it is architects do, because I didn't do that when I was an architecture student. I did performance electronic music. Yeah. It was the 60s. Um, anything was anything. <clears throat> and I, I hadn't understood this thing about models as simplifications. And of course, then you look at architecture and you say yes. And then the idea that the building, for instance, was a model of that exquisite thing made out of card and balsa and beach and bits of spun wire and so on, was absolutely mind-blowing. And I thought, this is the stuff for me. So I stopped messing around with the uh, circuitry. None of which ever worked anyway. And I packed it too tight. Everything interfered with everything else. Um, and I, well, I you've I'm losing some of your words. You, you sort of swallow some words. Those are because they're the secret words. Yes, well, I know. I, I feel I'm missing the secret. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then, I, as I was telling the, the people who came on Monday, there was this extraordinary event at Brunel um, when Gordon got both Heinz von Furster and Humberto Maturana to come and visit us. And, and we think it was the 12th of April, 1973. Um, and these two people came in. Now, I, because I was interested in music, had never heard of Maturana. But I'd heard of Martirano, and I was expecting an, electronic, an experimental electronic musician. So I was very surprised when a small person talking about Hong Kati Nathan, Hong Kati Nathan, came in. And, and th there were the two of them, and Martirano was absolutely entrancing. You know, to hear someone speak in that way about things that did things that it was just mind blowing. It was just astonishing. But actually the one who really impressed me more when I thought later um, was Heinz. And, and Heinz presented, um, Maturana presented autopoiesis. So, you know, this is right at the beginning. We were one of the very first audiences to hear about this stuff. Uh, and then um, Heinz presented his paper Notes on an Epistemology for Living Things. 
And what amazed me about that was it was an entirely circular argument. He went round this thing and ended up right back where he'd started. And that's what he was talking about. The epistemology for living things was that circle. And so the form and the content matched. And that for me is a definition, a definition, of what art is about. It's when you get form and content so they're indistinguishable. And it was the first time I had ever come across a scientist talking in the way an artist would talk. So it was an extraordinary moment for me, this, this evening and the dinner afterwards in Valcheris Swiss restaurant in Richmond. Everyone up Maturana's end of the table, poor old Heinz down there, and I, me, I arrived late. So, <laughs> so everyone was up there and I had to sit opposite Heinz and I had Heinz to myself for the evening. You know, I, I got the good deal. You know, I'm very, very fond of Chicho. But to have Heinz to yourself for an evening at that stage in your study was just extraordinary. And the other thing that I liked about what was happening was this notion that the observer couldn't be ignored, that we had to recognize that as Heinz claimed Ernst and Ernst came, claimed Heinz said, um, objectivity is the delusion that observing can be done without an observer. No, sorry, it's an observer's delusion that observing can be done without him. Is that right, Albert? Have I got it right? Yes, and it's due to Albert that I know that Heinz accuses Ernst of this and Ernst accuses <laughs> Heinz of this. So whoever you give as the origin, you're wrong. All right, this is a flip-flop. <laughs> so, and the way that Gordon was talking about communication, not as this automated stream that goes along with bits and this sort of curious stuff called information, which has nothing to do with form, giving form, so which is what information is about, this strange thing that Shannon and Weaver churned out. Um, and to find Gordon talking about conversation and the individual understanding and so on. You, you'll understand that for someone who went to a Froebel school, this was the stuff I grew up on. Well. <clears throat> so, there was a particular question that, that kept coming to my mind. If we all understand the world differently, how do we know when we say that camera there that we're dealing with the same thing? Because our experience is different, our way of describing it must therefore be slightly different, so we don't know what this referent is. And the thing that I became interested in is how can we construct a system which allows us to believe that each of us is understanding in our own way, making our own meanings, yet to treat it as if those understandings were of the same thing. And I think that that's a crucial question. Without answering that question, second order cybernetics does wallow on the edge of solipsism unless you have some sort of framework that supports this difference you're sort of lost you're endlessly negotiating in a conversation you don't know that you have the same thing in common another way of putting it is not well not so much do i know that we share the same thing of reference but how can we behave as if we are sharing the same same item of reference um, and that's I think a, a crucial human trick because we God only knows what the world looks like to each of you I'm not even sure I know what it looks like to me but given that absolute uncertainty we have made the assumption that we are referring to the same thing yet if we're all seeing it differently how do we know it's the same thing we really need something there that allows us 
not uh, to know but at least to act as if it were the same thing and feel confident that we are enabled to act that way and we need it because we do it we need it because I think what humans do is we find excuses for how we live you know and we call them theory and so on <laughs> an explanation but that that to me is is the you know, human beings find patterns in their experience and we make sense of this and, and so what I set about doing was producing something which would give me a structure that would allow that all of us saw differently but could pretend we were seeing the same thing whatever thing means this could be an idea it's not a physical thing um, and I discovered the answer to how to do this having gone away and read the stuff that I'd written every morning for six months from five in the morning till nine in the morning ganglions from typing eight copies through the carbons you know that sort of stuff 1970 and I went away to a hut in Finland 1974 with this pile of paper and I, I thought I was just going to go away and make sure the terms were consistent and I started reading this stuff and it was incomprehensible mud you know that Beckett book how it is where the hero is swimming through mud that was it that was it I wa it was incomprehensible and I don't even know that I've got a copy I think my girlfriend <laughs> a few years later took it and kept it so I think that I I am the person who doesn't have a copy of this piece of sort of turgid nothing and I was so upset I left my then wife my newborn son and my parents in this hut and flew back to England to try to sort something out and I had six hours sitting in the airport at Copenhagen and suddenly I got one key idea which unlocked the whole thing. It was just one very simple idea. It's so obvious that, you know, it's absurd. And I will come to that in a moment. Luther, just a moment. Yeah. Is anybody cold? No. No, sure. It's okay. So. Okay. I am. Thank you. Turn it off. Sorry? Turn it off. Well, shall I turn, it, shall I turn off the air conditioning? Yes. Yes. But, you know. <laughs> All right. Um, just before I try to get into recreating at least the basis of this stuff, I want to take another sidetrack, but I think it's important. Um, and and I, I hope that that bit of autobiography will tell you something about why I did this and will help it make sense because I, it's so sort of context-free and abstract this stuff that otherwise I think uh, I, well I know that people have found this endlessly confusing endlessly confusing Byrne uh, talks about it as pre-ontological so if you that's I think makes it pretty obscure stuff <laughs> um, and that's why did I call why did I talk about objects you know and I say object many of us think of something solid and so on this is not about things that are solid. And, and object is a really interesting word. Um, Isaac Asimov, somewhere or other, talked about the way that object and subject have changed their meanings since the Middle Ages. So, um, and if you think of it, a subject which we're going to study is supposedly objective knowledge. So a subject is objective, and in studying it, I've probably got the objective of learning something and if I'm not too good I'll look at it through an objective in order to satisfy my objective to look at this object which is the book in which the subject is which is subject to my glance and so on and on and on these words are not distinct subject and object are the same word uh, and I used object partly because it is it is its own contradiction it is a living paradox as a word um, and I used it because I wanted to get at that sense of confusion because I think it's very difficult to rethink things unless 
you are prepared to allow confusion in. The other word I'm going to use is observe and in this room it won't be a problem but sometimes people think observe is this. Yeah. So I'm talking about something more general and more abstract than looking at things. Okay. One more little side which is um, to say thank you to Mike and then to Jan because they asked that I should talk about this here and it is probably 25 years since I talked about this stuff in public okay now let's see if I can do it <laughs> um, What I'm talking about is things which can be observed so that we all see them differently, but we believe they are the same thing. Excuse the visual sense of the language, it's not because I'm particularly visual, it's just this is how it came out. So we are dominated by visual metaphors. <coughs> what I'm talking about therefore is at least a universe of observation. That's the entry criterion for being part of this universe is that you are observing. So I ask myself what is the essential entry condition that I can be part of this universe of observing or of observation? And the answer is the thing which the, uh, the answer that requires less than anything else is that I observe myself. By doing this I satisfy the requirement that I am observing, that I am observed and that I am observable. I don't have to refer to anything else at all as long as I allow this self-reference. Now I actually don't think anyone in this room is going to find this strange. Do you not on occasion observe yourself? So I don't think it's such a very peculiar thing to do. But it is in terms of talking about things which are observable it's actually very strange because it's saying the agency of observing is the thing. So it's turning observable into a sort of verb. The observability lies in the observing. <clears throat> and this is what I call an object. Now this is what I got in Copenhagen Airport. So, um, I can talk in this way. I can say that in order to enter my universe of discourse, which universe of observing and observation, whatever, I can say that I observe I, me. If you, if you want to be grammatical, but that's too advanced for me already. <laughs> Now, what do I need that I am able to observe I? I need myself to be both the subject and the object of my observing. Oh, there's that word again. There. And actually, because it's just one, the subject and the object are the same. So it's sort of I, and I notated that in this way. First of all, I used I used a triangular bracket as a naming. So I can call that an object, and I will define which one it is by putting in a subscript. So that would be object A. 
And that's just a naming. It just means that I can talk about it without having to go through lots of sort of garbage to do so. And object A is I observing I. So um, I will call, I will denote myself as an observer by the letter P. Why the letter P? Because I've already used O, so I can't use O. And because it's a little tribute to Gordon. So Gordon had observing entities which he called psychological individuals. Yeah? P individuals. So P is a little thank you to Gordon. P A, that's the observing me. Then I put in a means of observation which I marked as X which I said is a model facility, which was also a nod to Gordon, who had a modeling facility. I, when I put this in, I was very unsure of it, whether I needed it or not. <coughs> Gordon said, of course you need it. <laughs> and in the 40 years since, <coughs> I have remained unsure that I need it. And it is there because it's there. <laughs> I am not sure that this is needed at all. And then, uh, this is a gives rise to, but it should of course be bidirectional, but in those days it wasn't, and there is a convenience in having it appear one directional. And that is this, which is the I observed bit. And I said that because it is I observing I, this is the essence of I. So E stands for essence. Sorry, guys. I, I'm a very naive philosopher. <coughs> yeah, so. Now, very simple sort of thing. I know that it, if, you, if you don't do letters and so on. Uh, if you don't do formalisms, this may look opaque, but actually it's just a sentence. I observing, observe, I being observed. I subject, I object. And we were told uh, when I was doing my PhD that we had to use formal languages. Actually, this is one I invented because I could never cope with the real ones. <coughs> okay, now, I have a problem with this, and the problem is this. How can I appear twice when there's only one me? And uh, it's not to do with the subject-object thing. It's to do with me ne needing to be in two places at the same time. I need to be both sides of the, the equation. But the point of this thing is to establish I or anything else. Yeah? And I thought about this and it seemed to me that there was a very simple answer and it is that this is an oscillator. <coughs> So now I want to introduce some time. Have we got an eraser that will work? Will this work on an ordinary board? Yes? OK. I love blackboards and to a much less extent whiteboards. It's the only excuse when lecturing to turn away from your audience. It's the way that you can hide. Make a little note for yourself. <laughs> it's another reason PowerPoints are so odious. Well, I said, and the answer to this is make it an oscillator um, and just uh, have time. OK. So we'll say at time. Why did I use S for time? Because I'd already used T for a transformation. 
to do with something else that got into this document. So T is a transformation, so it wasn't available. So S is speed, which is time. Okay, so and I have seen S used for time by other people. So I thought, okay, we have S and then, oh sorry, I have S here, and then we'll have uh, S prime here, and an S prime I get that. And now I go S plus 1. S plus 1 prime. Okay. This means that this is now not only circular, it's dynamic. Yeah? So it's not a sort of look down at it, it's a, it is creating the circularity all the time. So this is an object as a process. Now, I don't mean that this is a process running round and round and round. What I mean is that that which allows us to think about this in the way in which I have been describing can be represented in some way like this. This is no claim about a reality or an actuality. It is simply a formulation that allows us to, that accommodates the beliefs that I think we like and find convenient and helpful to hold. It is not about a physical world or a mental world. It's about the conditions in which we can have a mental world that allows us a physical world. Now, I'd like you just to note these. At the time that I was doing this stuff, there was something around called a Petri net. And I expect lots of you, do you know about Petri nets? The key thing in a Petri net is that if you wish to make progress, it's a, it's a connection of lots of points in some sort of network, and if you wish to move to the next thing, it has to be empty. And if it's not empty, you've got a jam, you've got a queue. So um, for those of you who are Dutch, you may remember the old roundabouts in Holland, which gave priority, priority à droite, priority to traffic on the right, gave priority to traffic going into the roundabout, not to traffic coming out. This is being consistent and very French and very academic. So uh, there's this rule that uh, there's always priority to traffic from the right. And so the traffic from the right, which was the traffic entering the roundabout, had priority. The Dutch complained that roundabouts were silly and didn't work. The moment they said the priority is to get off the roundabout, all their roundabouts worked. It was a really very simple thing. Yeah? <coughs> I'm sure it's not just the Dutch, but I happen to know that it was the case in Holland. Um, so what Petri was saying in his nets, and I, there's lots more, but the thing that I found really interesting was that you can't go into a space that's already full. So if you wish to carry out a computation, for instance, and put the result somewhere, it has to be empty. You have to have empty boxes. Yeah? And what we have here is emptiness. Well, let's have another object. Um, why shouldn't there be more than one? Uh, if I say I know this, then there's a this as well. Um, so, <coughs> let me have uh, another object. I'm going to draw it the other way round. So, I'm going to start from right to left instead of left to right and this but I'm not going to turn the letters around this is PB which is actually it's not sorry it's not that uh, what do I need I need to come here uh, so PB um, 
And I'm sorry, I need a tiny little bit more space. P. We're getting there. This is S for A. PB. I am out of practice. Now, this, uh, you can see it's the same thing going down. So this is uh, SB, S prime B, S plus one B, yeah? All I've done is repeat this, but I've, I'm starting from right to left. And the reason I'm starting from right to left is, you know what? This thing is busy observing, but this one isn't using its observing powers. It's using its being observed powers. And you know what? There's a slot here saying, come and do some observing. And so, E, let's draw it with B being observed, is in the position to observe through there. Yeah. So, so long as these times synchronize, this thing can be looking through that keyhole, that window, whatever. Yeah. What that means is that in a universe of these objects, the observing of others is possible. And that observing will be different for the object itself and for every observer. Because it's be, the, the observing is done this way. You see what I'm getting at? Okay. <coughs> I have a I move to a simpler notation. I need different notations for these things. So I could say here that the time of observation of stay down here. The time of observation of A and of B synchronizes. And I could have a third object, which would synchronize. That, oh, uh, yes, right, um, I'll come to that. But I could also have, forget the third one for the moment. I can also have something where the times only partially synchronize. Yeah? If I <coughs> this arc represents B observing A. It is the time in which B observes A. So this is by B of A. Now this is by B of another object C. And this is when they synchronize. If they synchronize completely, I could say that the conditions of these observations, which are, after all, different, that is, B, uh, A and C are different objects, nevertheless, they synchronize completely, so I'm saying there's an identity between these observations. So, in this case, what I get is a logical operator, which is that for, for B, A, sorry, A and C are identical at this time. So the time that comes from I not being able to be both its subject and its object simultaneously gives me the possibility of developing a logic. 
And this gives me the possibility of representation. So if I can say my observation that two quite separate things are the same, I can say one stands for the other or the other stands for the one. So I have in this introduction of time the basis of a logic and of communication. What would happen if these arcs weren't the same? For instance, what would happen if they were like that? Anyone want to risk an answer? <coughs> Me looking at myself yesterday. Th this, oh. <laughs> um, I don't think I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I could do this. I could say I'm interested in that bit and that's a logical and. This is the intersection of the two. I could say I'm interested in this and that's an exclusive or. Oh, an inclusive or. If they don't meet at all, I've got a negation. That is, this doesn't relate to that. That's what my negation means. So extraordinarily, out of this statement, which comes from that linguistic statement, what I end up with is time. And from the time, I end up with a logic that allows representation and it allows me to assemble things. For instance, um, wood and screen there to make a wooden screen. So I have now a way, a world which is populated by these things, none of which are on any different level to anything else. They all enter this universe in the same way, which I, as an inhabitant of the, or of the universe, can organize into my own hierarchies and heterarchies. I can dissemble them and so on. I can relate them together. I can represent them to another one of these. You observe you, for me. And there are other things I can do. I can, for instance, um, talk about the behavior of something. Yeah? The behavior is uh, the opposite of the essence, the behavior is my viewing of what you do. So, uh, when, when I go into that slot, what I'm actually doing is seeing you here, not as your essence, but as a behavior, because I can't see your essence. So, and I can take the sum of those behaviours, which go on and on and on and on, and produce something which stabilises, as we know, the more you observe something, if it has an identity, the more you learn to accommodate everything and treat it as one. That's what the Eigen operator does when Heinz talks about his objects, his Eigen objects. Yeah? Um, you can talk about all of the observings that you do adding up in the same sort of way and those of course make you in a sense who you are at least to the outside world and that's uh, I call it your awareness um, now there's a whole pile of things you can do with this for instance you can talk about these as memories and the interesting thing is that uh, if these don't synchronize I can sort of have a strong feeling that they're there but I can't observe them do you remember <coughs> being saying, I know that, I just can't remember it? Yeah. So it accounts for things like that. You can use it to account for developing consciousness. I can put things together, I can hold conversations with other people, I can represent. You've got the basics for all of these sorts of things. I'm not going to try to present them because, to be quite honest, uh, I get really lost in there at the moment. I, looked at this stuff last night and thought you need, a, you need to go down to the service station and get some rust scraped off. Um, but what I hope that I've done is told you why this mattered to me 
Secondly, why this matters to, second, uh, to cybernetics, particularly second order cybernetics, because this is the framework which allows everyone else's work in second order cybernetics to exist, because it allows that although there is this vast individual difference that we accept, that we can talk as if there is a common reference, a common center of attention, without which we really <coughs> are sort of stuck. Um, I've shown you how you can observe other things. I've shown you how observing yourself, that is, being within this universe, being an inhabitant of the universe, generates a need for time, so I stick time in there, because this is about an explanatory framework. It's not about truth, it's not about is time there, it is about what do you need to be able to do certain things. And there may be much better ways of doing it than this, but I haven't come across them yet. Um, from the time I get to be able to observe other things, there are slots that I can look through, from the time of observation of other things, I get the possibility to build relationships, to develop a logic, and therefore to be able to communicate and to establish hierarchies and assemble things. And finally, from the process of continuing to do, I can move towards um, sort of stabilized, large-scale sort of samenesses which either add up to me, that is, I am the result of all of these sorts of things, or add up to you, that is, you are the result of all these sorts of things. And if I look at you, it's your behavior. And if I look at me, it's my awareness. Uh, and I think that perhaps is enough. Thank you, by the way, for not interrupting me because it was difficult to follow my own thread and yeah. not, not get lost. And so I hope to give you at least an almost clear thread.